My name is Andrew Hughes, and today I'm going to be talking about today's gaming platforms and tomorrow's learning development tools. Sorry to the videographers for hopping over there. I'm not allowed to go over there. Um, and today we're going to talk a little bit about the tools that were actually being used in the industry by uh, some of the larger commercial companies. Also, what's being used by the military. And what you're going to find is the military is vastly superior when it comes to simulation and gaming than we are in the corporate world. So we're going to talk a little bit about what they're doing. And we're also going to talk about um, 2D and uh, 3D gaming engines that you could be used um, to uh, enhance or even replace some of the e-learning tools that you're using today. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Um, the first thing that I wanna talk about a little bit is what is an actual game? Um, in my opinion, a game is a journey with challenges that you must overcome by learning how to overcome that challenge. That's what a game means to me. So it doesn't matter if it's Candy Crush, Bejeweled, um, or Call of Duty. I still have a journey, I still have levels, I still have somewhere to go, I have challenges, and I have to learn while trying to overcome those challenges or learning how to overcome those challenges. So the funny thing I think about is games are the closest thing to our lives, our real, actual lives, okay? Not what we're told, but the way that life actually works. What happens is we try on error. We mess something up, we try again, right? Isn't that the key of life? Try again, don't give up, try again, right? But that's not how we do it with education, right? Try once, you failed, then you try, and you failed, we have a problem. We need to assess you. We need to figure out what's going on. Why are you failing? Well, the fact of the matter is that's how life works. That's how we're ingrained. So I thought it was funny. How many of you guys have actually seen this video, which I don't think I have audio? Um, the your whole life is a game. Has anybody uh, seen this video before? Um, it's actually very uh, funny. I don't have audio, but basically what it says is you first start to, on the tutorial levels from age zero to 18, um, where you're actually leveling up, but the problem is, is you can only interact with one or two characters in the game at that time. Does anybody know who that is? Our parents, right? So what ends up happening is you learn from and you continue to trial and error as you progress through. And depending on how good your parents were, depends on how good you do during those tutorial levels. Right? That is a fundamental statistic. How much your parents are involved in your life has a big outcome on how you do. Then from there, we actually go into the educational tutorial levels that last from like 5 to 18, where what we're doing is learning all this context material that doesn't necessarily apply to the actual rest of the game or the rest of our lives, <laughs> right? Now we have two different options. We can, at this point, download the downloadable, which is the college education, which is the add-on to our lives, or we can actually start the actual game. However, if we download the, uh, the college level, we will start with more attributes, but we'll start off with less money. As you actually go through the game, there are three different types of currency that we're after. Love and relationships, which is what you see here. Money, which is what we're constantly after. And anything else? Can anyone think about the third most important currency in our lives? Money, bam, you nailed it. Who said it, Kate? Time, time is the other one. So technically in your life, you have three status indicators. Love and relationship, money and time. And those things are what you're balancing at all times. All right? Now, in regards to that, there are situations where they make fun of people because they're non-playing characters. That would be you going through your day and not actually doing anything other than your normal routine. Um, but fact of the matter is, there's no real actual ending, is there, to your life when it comes to what um, avenue you could go in. You could do anything you would like to in life. We all end the game the exact same way, right? We all end life dead. So the fact of the matter is when you get to towards the end of the game, from 65 to 80, you've filled up all of those meters. So time's running out, you have good relationships, you have the money that you have, but now you're too old to actually utilize your money, travel, and be able to use that spare time because what has happened? All the iterations of your game character are now breaking down because there's been so many different levels and you've been playing for so long that their character no longer works the way it used to. And from there, you have an end game from 65 to 80. That is literally 
If you were looking at our lives as human species, as a game, that's exactly how it goes. So for all of you, I hope that didn't depress you tremendously, and I hope you're playing a lot better than the, this guy did at their game, okay? So why, can we, why do we do learning in serious games? Here's what I can tell you. Games, we've been doing games since they were card games. How many of you played Euchre with your family? Poker, Solitaire, anything like that? What I think is vastly amazing is that games are not discriminated by age, okay? I am so tired of hearing that. Well, I don't play games. Bullshit. You do too. You play card games. You play games. You play games in your head with yourself. You don't even notice it, right? How many of you have ever had to do a terrible task? For instance, I used to lift weights all the time before the hernia, if you were wondering. This is a hernia sticking out that I had to get it repaired, okay? <laughs> For all of you that are looking at me like, why has he got a big bump in his stomach? I literally have a hernia poking out of my stomach, all right? So um, where I was going is when I used to work out all the time, I'd play this game where you count to four instead of counting to five, because for some reason five was exhausting to me. So I go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. That is a game. I'm playing a game with my own mind. You do this all the time. Games are ingrained in you, no matter who you are, what age you are, and what you're doing. The fact of the matter is, we don't consider games learning, and that's the hard part about it. What we have known, though, is there are studies, scientific studies, that have shown people that play games on a regular basis actually have more intertwined gray matter in their brains after long periods of time of playing games than people that do not. For all of you that are wondering, that means there's more interconnections happening in the neurons of their brain than they are in somebody that does not. Why? Because here's the thing, games stimulate people in ways that they don't get stimulated before. When you're stimulated in a different way, your brain has to react a different way. It has to adapt and change. Why? Because your brain is made that way to be able to challenge itself, change itself, and be able to work around the things that it needs to. All right. How many of you guys have ever taken this test? The blue, purple, yellow, red? Anybody ever done this one? And you're like, what's going on, right? The fact of the matter is what's happening is your subconscious brain is playing a game on your conscious brain and it's an actual fight between those two. And you never notice it. You never notice it. But it's a game between the two types of your brains and they're fighting against each other to figure out what they actually should do. So it's interesting that we have all these games happening in our lives but we don't necessarily consider them games. So a great example of that is here's what you should know. When you are having fun, it produces engagement. When you are enjoying doing something, you are engaged and you participate, right? But if you don't enjoy it, you don't participate. Engagement directly results in sticky, retentive content. It directly results. If they're engaged, they're interested. If they're interested, it sticks. If it sticks, it's retained, period. That's how our brains work. For instance, how many of you guys meet someone, and I always think this one's fascinating. You ever meet someone, you shake their hand, hi, I'm John, nice to meet you, da, da, da. But if there is not a single particular reason that you're engaged with them, you don't remember their name, do you? I have this thing, I'll tell everybody right off the bat, I will not remember your name until the second time I meet you. Second time, my brain cannot and will not do it. I don't know why, but at least I know. Why? For some reason, I am not engaged enough in that initial conversation unless it's sparking my interest. Then I'll remember your name. Does everybody understand that? Engagement equals retention. See, this is the fun thing I think. Serious games are not uh, generationally discriminating. Again, I hear this a lot. And here's a great example. The number one <laughs> player of Counter-Strike is the oldest person you could imagine possible. I think he's 71 years old. Yep. And he is, he's just started playing this on his own, on his computer, for fun because it was free. Now he's ranked in the top 10 nationally. Tell me that age is the reason, because it's not at all. It's not about age. It's about interests. Okay? Every one of us has a different interest. Every one of us has passions. Everyone has set priorities in their lives and those interests in their lives. In fact, no matter this, this guy made this an interest and then he took off with it. The next thing, and this is one of, if you've ever been in my presentation, this is one of my biggest pet peeves ever. 
Serious Games is not about your digital swag. No one cares about your leaderboards, your trophies, and your badges. Nobody cares, okay? The only, the only way, and, and I tell you this because there are a lot of success stories, okay? I'll state that. The fact of the matter is it works really good with type A personalities, such as people like sales that love to compete against each other. But the fact of the matter is that is 10% of your, your actual staff in which you have to train. And the, also the problem with that is, is those, that 10% are your high performers or they wouldn't be in sales in the first place. So therefore, you're encouraging your high performers to be high performers. That doesn't make any sense, does it? So you take an average engineer, right, that has engineering problems that they have to deal with, they have tight deadlines on things, you shove a course in front of them, they get a badge, you think they care? They don't care about your badge. They are an engineer dealing with this, 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 and this. But they have to take your training because somebody told them to. But they don't care about the badges. You know what they will care about? The interest, the engagement, which engagement turns into retention, which retention turns into learning, which turns into bu uh, enhancing business practices, period. They all just fall in line as a domino. If you can get them interested, you can get them engaged, they will retain it and they will increase business practices. The next thing that I always hear is, well, what lends itself best to a serious game? Here's what I can tell you. There is no secret genie lamp. Okay, not everything lends itself to a game. There's no reason if you need to get some information out quickly that you shouldn't do it in a video. Did y'all hear that? Shouldn't do it in a quick explainer video. If you want something where they're deeply engaged and you're gonna assess them, did everybody hear this? Serious games work the best when you use them as an assessment tool. An assessment tool. Because this is what ends up happening when I get people that come to us for games. They turn around and say, we should make a game for this. And we turn around and the next thing we ask, and we develop these learning games all the time. We ask why. And the first thing they do is, uh, well, this is your expertise. And I say, yeah, this is our expertise, but I'm asking you why are, do you want to do this? Like, is this actually going to motivate them? Is this what they want, okay? Is this what they want? And serious games are not bang, bang, pew, pew, pow, bang. <laughs> okay, this is not a serious game, okay? The only way that something like this could qualify as a serious game is for our military. Because here's what's shocking, and for all of you that have heard this before, I apologize, but I have yet to lose this bet. And this is going on four and a half years now. I will bet you $20 in my wallet to any person in this room, if your son, daughter, or grandkids play Call of Duty, if you call them or text them right now and ask them, what's the best sniper rifle to use in an urban combat setting? They will answer you instantaneously. Why? Because they've learned from this game. They've learned all the military weapons. That's what's terrifying. Your kids know every single modern military weapon being used in the military today. But it's not learning, is it? Because we didn't say it was valuable. That's the problem. Learning happens all the time. The problem is, as instructional designers, educators, training directors, what we value as learning is something that we are pigeonholing ourselves in. So think about that. Try it out. And if you get a different answer, let me know, because I highly doubt you will. They have been trained. They have been tricked by a game in learning what weapons to use and where. So here's the other thing. Games cannot be a requirement of people. If you were required to play this, which we know the most learning and most e-learning is required to them, but if we make it absolutely required, they're gonna come in with a negative connotation right off the bat, just instantaneously. They're going to say, I don't wanna do this, I really don't wanna to like to do this. So you know what we've done? Is we built the learning material your, your presentation, level two, level three learning material, and then built learning assessments that tie into that. So now we turn around and say, you gotta take the learning. But when they get to the assessment, they're like, oh, hey, a game, all right. Because you can't change how people feel about e-learning. Because I'm gonna tell you this right now, everybody in here loves it. Everybody outside of this room hates it. Hates it with a passion. They hate it, they hate it. You talk to engineers, salespeople, they hate this stuff hate it. They absolutely hate what we do. It's true. 
So the fact of the matter is, if you can integrate it into an assessment piece, you're more likely to get them to enjoy that part, which is them actually attesting and applying what they should have learned. So here's a great example of that. Um, anybody heard of the company Mercer? They're a $3 billion HR company. They actually came to us and said, we have some problems with um, consultative sales practices. So what we ended up doing is building a mini assessment game um, that you see here that what, what this does is actually walks them through the entire sales process that they do at Mercer. Now the interesting part is we just don't come in and be like, we're gonna build you this game, give me your sales process. No, they literally had a business problem. We had, a, we had to solve the business problem. And what they actually said was, we don't even know our consultative sales process. And I said, you're a $3 billion company. How do you not know your sales process? We don't. So the first thing we had to do was break down their sales process. And then from there, build an assessment learning experience around it. Then what we did is we actually interviewed all the salespeople and used real assessments from them. And if you click on that, you can actually hear from the CEO at this actual scenario that he was in as a salesperson years ago. So we went out and interviewed them. Why? Because we wanted relevance, not just, well, we play this stupid game, it doesn't apply. Yes, it does. Here's, here's it actually applying to what you're doing. Here's the CEO back when he was a sales rep at this company in the situation that he saw. And you're gonna follow right th through there. So rather than just making up situations, we actually made it uh, applicable as close as we could to what they do. And then what ends up, ends up happening is the buildings unlock, it gets harder and harder as you go, and then there was a mastery challenge score that then was submitted um, for them to actually see from, the score, or from a high scoreboard or how well the sales reps did. So what's the actual purpose of these, of, of doing serious games? Well, here's what I think is interesting. If you, okay, so I have a three and a half and a 21 day old at home. Yeah, I know. So thank you, honey, for letting me come here and letting me sleep in this morning. I owe you for that one. Um, so I asked myself, what is the purpose? I have a three and a half year old and I have a, a newborn. My three and a half year old is literally has an Amazon Fire and is downloading and playing the educational games at three and a half years old, okay? I'm not saying that because he's some genius. What I'm saying is they, for the people that are in this room, not one of you grew up at three and a half years old with an iPad or a tablet in your hand. We are, the la we are a generation that started analog and ended digital. We are the last generation of groups of people to have that, okay? So the fact of the matter is, we are trying to train people that are wired completely different than we are. Completely different. Now I state that because I always make this, con <laughs> this, this situation. How many of you guys have a cell phone with you right now? Right? How many of you have smartphones with you? For the ones that don't, you're a drug dealer. We all know, okay? <laughs> all right? No one doesn't have a smartphone unless they're doing something illegal, all right? So here's what I can tell you. 100 years ago, 100 years ago, all right? My grandfather was born in 1918. That would have been 1918. If I, if you would have walked around in 1918 yelling, you're going to have a computer in your hand in 100 years, and you're going to be able to message anybody and everyone in the world, and you're going to be able to make transactions, and you're going to be able to buy everything that you need, you're going to be able to talk to everybody, you're going to be able to see each other in the face, you'd have been burned at the stake. They would have hung you for talking that crazy. 100 years, look what's in your hand. It's only been a hundred years, okay? A hundred years. You would have been burnt to the stake. There's no way they would have believed you. They would have thought you were insane. So, all right, fast forward, right? We're now in a generation where these are the status norm. And we're now in an era where these are the status norm. And we're in an era where e-learning is being changed from being boring presentation, pushing information out, to them actually going for it. So what's the purpose? It's to educate and engage and entertain them. And I want to show you one quick one real quick, and we'll start getting into the actual uh, pieces. This is called VODA. It's called Virtual Occupation Therapy Assistant. This is rolled out to all the hospitals in the United States right now on the OTs. What this is, is um, we worked with the National Institute of Health and Barron Associates to develop a Microsoft Connect game, and there's about 16 different games, that teaches you how to reuse your left or right arm after you have a stroke or um, after some horrific accident where you can't use your arm or one side of your body. And this game literally allows you to do not just learning how to do the things you used to be able to do before, but there's games like a balloon flight where you're in charge of 
moving the balloon and flying the balloon. There are ring toss games. There's a ton of different games. And then what we've done is we've actually have it tracking in detail to compare it to the past time that they did it. And they do it every day for about three to six months to see how well, and we can actually see the vast differences in their ability to move their arms. So what this does is it takes occupational therapy from here, lift up this weight 10 times, to actually allowing them to do something fun, engaging them in it. They don't wanna stop doing this. They'll turn around and be like, my arm's sore, it hurts, but I don't wanna stop, I don't wanna stop. And that's what we hear. That's what we want, right? Don't we want them pushing themselves, getting better at it? They don't do that when you say, lift this 10 times. The, our e-learning is equivalent to a dumbbell in an occupational therapist's office right now. That's what we have. So what are some of the results from this material? Well, the first one that I want to just quickly go through, how many of you guys have seen Domino's Pizza Hero? Anybody? So this is a free app, and this app is on the App Store. Now, for all of you who are going, this is just learning how to make the pizzas, right? Here's where the Domino's got real smart. What they ended up doing is you have to register with your age, your address, your phone number, and your name, right? And you're all thinking, dang, they got my information. Here's what they did. Anybody from the age of 16 to 19 that are in the top 5,000 of this game, their, their recruiters called them and, and offered them jobs. They were already trained on how to make the pizzas. This is your app? Yes. We know how to make the pizzas. Yes. Think about it. Think about it for a second. Think about how effective that is. Having your staff trained before they even walk in the door. Wouldn't that be the best thing ever? Oh, think about how much money the business would save. Think about how much work you would save. And I state this because I'm going to have a shout out to Camtasia and the TechSmith me people. Um, great examples. I was talking to Matt Pierce last night. Our company internally, there's a company where there's 20 of us. We actually built 150 um, informal videos with Camtasia to help build up our own university, our informal university. And I want to prove this. That this is an actual um, example. It took me three and a half, or it took me four months to train a salesperson from the beginning of the day, the beginning from the end of them walking in to here's your commission um, schedule. I recorded all those videos, did it again. It took me two months because now instead of me presenting it, walking them through it, giving them an evaluation of how well they did, it was go watch this presentation, go try it, then let's meet and see what we need to fix. Go watch this presentation. It cut the time in half for me. And those are informal videos. So I'm just saying, you can find results in everything that you're doing if you do it effectively. So the question is, what tools are people using? Well, first I can tell you this. I saw some really cool things in Storyline, Captivate, yes, Captivate. Storyline, Captivate, Raptivity, and Lectora. I've seen uh, gamified learning uh, experiences out of that. It's not necessarily about the actual um, tool. Um, these tools obviously will make it uh, more enhanced than what you can do in those programs, but take into consideration it's about the creativity of what you can do, and especially about the detailed storylines like Katie was talking about. Okay? Okay, sorry. Um, first thing I want to do is kind of break these into two things. The first thing that we have is our heavy gaming engines. These are the ones that we're doing 3D experiences in, um, heavy 3D mobile, like what they build Madden and Grand Theft Auto for the mobile for, and VR and AR, okay? Then we have our light gaming engines. These are really focused on 2D, HTML5, and web. And we're gonna talk about those, okay? And I like to break it up into that so that we have kind of a distinguished understanding of the two. So the first ones that I wanna start with are the 3D gaming engines. I'm gonna give you the pros and the cons. Um, looking at this, here are the pros. You're gonna get a higher quality graphics. They have some very strong communities and it's already accepted by many of the industries, including the military. So the ones that I'm going to show you are already proved by the military, used by the military, um, and should be adopted by our, our industry also. The downfall is there is a very large learning curve to these. There can be a very expensive licenses for these. And um, one of the things you should know is mobile builds are currently focused on apps 
rather than export out to HTML5. Okay? You still can for anybody that's a Unity guru, but if you already know, you can export out to HTML5, for, but the problem is WebGL doesn't work on the mobile. So you can't do it for the mobile unless it's an app. Okay? For all of you that, do I have any super techies in here? One, two, yeah. So the first one I'm going to talk about is Unity. Anybody ever opened and looked at Unity? Yay! Okay, so here's what I think is awesome. Dave Helgeson's the CEO of Unity, or the founder of Unity, and one of the things that he had problems with is he was dealing with the fact that if you, anybody knew about the Unreal Engine, which we'll talk about, they made you give 20% um, of any profit that you made had to go back to the Unreal Engine. So if you use their engine, yeah, so think about all you e-learning developers. Are you kidding me? My $10,000 module, I got to give 2000 to them just for using the product? No. So Dave said, there's got to be a better way. There's got to be an industry-leading um, gaming engine that could possibly work. So what you're looking at is this is Unity 3D. Um, we use this heavily in our office. It's become very popular um, for both indie development companies and for large studios. Um, you are able to do both 2D and 3D in this gaming engine. Um, my advice, if you were going to pick up one of the heavy 3D gaming engines, this is the one to play with. Okay? It is free to use until you make a commercial viable product, then you have to buy a license. So everybody hear that? Free to use. Download it. You can mess with it. You can play with it. You can do whatever you would like with it. And what it'll do is you can still export it out. You can still make things. It'll just say, you know, Unity personal use. Okay? Um, it is a steep learning curve. Um, I would say, anybody ever played with, um, anybody ever played with like Blender or a 3D modeling program? You have the, about the equal amount of learning curve as you would if you're going to use, learn a 3D animation program. I'll touch on that. My son and I learned Yeah. And They are. Pretty nice. So there you go, it took the words right out of my mouth. The next thing I was gonna say is if you really wanna learn this material, there are so many YouTube videos that you do not need to hire a consultant company to teach you. You literally can go on YouTube. This is completely free, you can use, you can download, install, play with, do the Unity tutorial, and work with yourself back and forth on those. Now, don't let Craig fool you, he's, he's a developer, so. <laughs> Did he? Fantastic. That's awesome, man. That is awesome. That's what I mean. So if I were you guys, that's why I started with this one. This is my favorite, is Unity. So uh, we use it religiously in our office. On um, the next one that finally caught up with everybody is the Unreal Engine. This used to be the big one, early 2000s, late 1990s. This used to be what all the gaming studios were using. The problem is they had a humongous licensing cost plus the 20% cost. That's when Dave Helgeson and Unity stepped in and said, no, that's not right. So here's what I could tell you about the Unreal. It has a humongous community. It is now free to use for personal use because you know how industries work. Somebody comes out for free, the one that you're paying goes, crap, we got to do that too now. And so now Unreal is free to download and uh, install and use. It does have a steeper learning curve, in my opinion, than Unity. Uh, maybe it's my bias, but I can tell you it does have a steeper learning curve. And I think it has a steeper learning curve because um, Unreal has been going through iterations year after year after year, instead of somebody fresh start, starting something from the sc uh, scratch like what Unity did. Um, so in my opinion, Unreal has a steeper learning curve. Now, here's what the cool part about it is. It still exports, it still does equivalent to Unity. I mean, these two are running neck and neck against each other now. Um, my advice, again, they look a lot alike when you're actually utilizing the software, but I can tell you this one's a little more steep to mess with. Another thing you should know is how many of you guys have never used like a 3D gaming engine before? Yeah, here's what you should know. Your 3D models, the cool thing about like Unity and even Unreal, they have an entire uh, community of assets and you can buy 3D models and scripts and interactions from the store that import directly into this. So that would be like Storyline having a community that built little add-ons to Storyline that then you could download and just apply to your project and there it is, interacting that way. So that cuts down the learning curve tremendously to be able to use like the unit, it's called the Unity Asset Store and the Unreal Store, okay? And what I'm talking about, there might be like a $299 um, 
jump interaction or maybe a 5.99 and I'm talking $2.99. I'm not talking $299. I'm talking like $5 for maybe a 3D character that runs in a circle. Yeah. Do you know the price point? Yeah, um, right now the Unity license is under 1,000. Um, the Unreal is around 1,500, okay? So it's not, it's equivalent to buying Storyline right now, okay? And the way that it works is um, they're constantly updating it. So if you buy Unity 5, that's your license for Unity 5, but um, some of them they've grandfathered in, so it makes it nice to where when 6, 7 come out, you can do that, or you might have to upgrade depending on what you do. They have a new thing called Unity 1 where you can just have a grandfather, but it costs more. Yeah. Um, in my opinion, both of them are excellent. You don't necessarily have to do this like in-depth 3D. Here's what I can tell you. What was it, Craig? Yeah, 1500 bucks, yeah. Um, here's the thing I can tell you also. If you're gonna do 3D, people walking around in a 3D environment as an avatar is not getting them to the actual learning experience that they need to. So one of the things that I can tell you is about five, six, seven years ago, virtual worlds were really, really big. Does everybody remember that? Like Second Life and everything, right? We were big into it. We built tons of these Second Life islands for corporations, for universities, for government agencies. But the thing that I found is, and what we realized is that in the corporate training set, uh, world, it's about quick, get it to them and get out the door. Well, in military fashion, they have the time and energy because they're not paying you hourly to have you walk through this stuff 13 times and make sure you get it right because if not, you're gonna die. If they don't get it right with us, they forget a process or a policy and we yell at them and then we write them up and we make them to take training again. The risk isn't as high, right? But it's all about time for us and quickly turning it around and getting it out the door. So in my advice is if you're gonna do something like this in 3D, please don't make you be an avatar that walks around. You're actually wasting their time that way. It's better to have a click thing where they click and go to that and then actually do what you want them to do. Just because we find that what happens is we're explorers naturally. So we're not gonna go do the objective immediately and get out of there. They're gonna go explore, they're gonna jump, they're gonna jump on top of their friend, they're gonna make inappropriate things and then they may finally do the thing. And then you're gonna be like, this was supposed to only take an hour, why did it take three hours? Well, I couldn't figure out where to walk around to. Well, then you failed as a game designer. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and they, they do that for everything in the military. Everything, everything's built into a game. They are simulating every single thing that they do in the military. But again, the risk is much higher than what we're dealing with. So let's talk a little bit about light gaming engines and what options are out there for you guys to use, okay? Here's the uh, pluses and minuses about light gaming engines. They are easy to use, they have a less in, uh, barrier to entry. And who am I talking about? I'm talking about the average person that uses Storyline and Captivate, okay? Somebody like myself where I'm dangerous enough to make a course and I'll make it, but it's not gonna be the most amazing thing you've seen. Um, however, I'm dangerous enough to do it. What I found is you have an ease of use because you're already familiar with that time-based medium type of uh, development. Um, it's cost effective um, because the licenses are cheaper. You get light gaming. Here's what I can tell you. The key to building a serious game in our industry is light gaming. Okay, even the Domino's build was what I would consider a light gaming piece. Something quick, easy, they could do for fun when they're standing at, in a line, okay? That's what'll get them. Not necessarily this big, let's make Telltale's next Walking Dead game for, for compliance training, okay? Um, the one thing you can, I can say is they do have some limited features, they do have limited communities, and these are not L&D focused, okay? so. This, the word asset might be sprite in the gaming world, okay? So the definitions are still there, they're just different, okay? So as soon as you tie, oh, that's an asset to a sprite, oh, that's this to this, oh, that's this to this, your brain will go, got it, okay? Uh, first one, one of my uh, most favorite ones, and it just came out with the 2.0, uh, but it's in beta, is Game Maker Studio. Uh, Game Maker Studio is relatively inexpensive. It's only a couple hundred dollars for the actual uh, system. But anything and everything that you've ever done in Storyline at Captivate can be done in these gaming engines. 
And what do I mean by that is it doesn't have to be a side scroller or a first person shooter. It literally can be choose your own destination, choose your own path, right? We've all done branching and storyline and Captivate. That stuff's easy to do in here, okay? On top of that, any interactions, drag and drop, multiple choice, true and falses, uh, things like that. The only difference is, and this is where people are gonna go, you know how you click that beautiful little checkbox and storyline and Captivate says, make this SCORM compliant. We don't have that in the gaming engines. You actually have to code in with JavaScript your manifest file. For all of you that have never done that, you're like, <laughs> for all of you that have done it, it's not that bad, okay? But if you haven't done it, it's like, <laughs> don't worry, it's an XML document and a couple lines of code and you're a-okay, all right? And the cool part is that ADL, those guys over there are amazing, so they've documented it so much that you practically can copy and paste where to put it, all right? It's no, so for all of you that get scared about that, just keep that in mind. Another one um, that I have found to be actually, in my opinion, one of the easier ones to actually learn to use is um, the Construct 2 gaming engine. In Construct 2, the reason why I like it is that it exports straight out to HTML5 on a web browser. For all of you, um, that's sexy. And it works on the mobile because it's not using WebGL. On, the on a mobile device, on like Safari on the mobile uh, phone. And the reason why I like this one is I've done actually a, se uh, a seminar, like a three to four hour seminar on this where we actually do all the standard interactions that you do in Storyline, like here's a drag and drop interaction, here's a mini game interaction, um, here's a driving car interaction, here's a matching, a true and false, and we actually build those so you guys can see the difference between doing it in a gaming engine and doing it in Storyline and Captivate, okay? And the only reason why I state that is we have this perception that gaming or building in a gaming engine is vastly different than building an e-learning course. No, it all falls under interactive media. You're building interactive media. So take a step back from, you, from the word e-learning and gaming engine and think about what you're doing. You're building interactive media for people to interact with and to engage in, period. Doesn't matter if you're doing, using Storyline or Captivate or if you're using a gaming engine. You're building interactive media material. Anybody ever use Construct 2 or Game Maker? Yeah, they're great. They're both free to download and use until you want to go commercial with it, okay? So one of the things I can tell you is it's not necessarily about the tools, it's about the engagement mechanics. And I'll show you an example of this. How many of you guys are Family Guy, big into Family Guy? Woo! So they did this awesome episode, obviously I don't have audio, but um, they did this awesome episode where <laughs> Quagmire takes on Peter, in Tecmo Super Bowl. But this was a terrible game design. For all of you that don't remember, there was this awesome athlete called Bo Jackson. And Bo Jackson, they um, just so happened to make him a little faster and a little more <laughs> agile than anybody else in the game. And so this is real, by the way. You can, I literally can do this. You, this is not made up. Since you used Bo Jackson and they coded him and made it so easy to utilize this character to play this game, that it wasn't even fun anymore for the people playing against him. Why? Because his attributes were set too high and he could now run all the way around. <laughs> for all of you that don't see this, what's happening is Peter Griffin is making fun of Quagmire for not being able to tackle him and Quagmire is getting more and more pissed off. But it's true. I, I did this to my little brother all the time. Sorry, Alex. Um, but it's really true. This is the problem with bad game design. If you make it too easy for them, this is what happens. If you make it too hard for them, they get discouraged, okay? PT. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, and I just state because you want to make sure that you make it challenging, but not to the point where it, it's completely overwhelming. They'll just get discouraged, but not so easy that they end up Bo Jacksoning you the entire time, okay? No one, I, seriously, if you ever play Tecmo Bowl, like let's say you're at one of those arcade bars with your buddy, and you're like, dude, I'll take you on a Tecmo Bowl, pick the Raiders and just run with Bo Jackson. <laughs> game over and make a $20 bet on it. You'll be $20 richer, <laughs> all right? Then call me because you owe me a drink. So the next thing is, what about virtual reality and augmented reality? Here's another thing that is very popular in our industry. Um, the, here's what I can tell you. Those 2D gaming engines I showed you do not do virtual reality and do not do augmented reality. The 3D heavy hitters that I showed you are able to do both of the, all of that. Virtual reality and augmented reality, okay? Now, 
in VR, we have this problem. People are defining VR incorrectly. Here I go again, Craig, I'm sorry. Okay? So, this is what I make very clear. A 360 video is a 360 VR tour. It is not what you do with the HTC Vive and the Oculus Rift. So there's two different types of VR. You hear in the L&D community? Two types, okay? There's 360 video and there's 360, or 3D spatial. Everybody hear the definitions? 3D spatial and 360 video. Let me show you a 3D uh, spatial one. This is called VR Chop and Drop. Anybody um, have a Steam account? Steam account? So on Steam, you can download VR games. We actually developed this. Um, this was built for um, an, a gas and energy company. Um, they are responsible for their electric lines and, and the electrical line workers. And what we did is we took the HTC Vive and built out um, a VR chop and drop. Well, what you're doing is cutting out the trees at a residential location as one of those um, electrical line workers and how to effectively do it without hurting yourself or hurting the, or um, damaging the residential property. And what you're seeing right now is this is Greg wearing a VR headset and is able to do all of this. Greg's um, our gamification specialist. And um, what you're doing right now is you're actually immersed in this. So you can virtually walk, look around. Everybody, has anybody not wore a VR headset yet? The Vive or the Oculus? Okay, yeah, Kate, we're gonna have to get you that. I got you in, at Learning Solutions, I'll bring mine. Okay, um, but the biggest difference is the environment is done in 3D. The entire experience is done in 3D, okay? And you're in this 3D world that you're interacting in. Now, here is what I would consider to be 3D video. And I'll just take this one. I don't know if it'll play. Let me click and see if it'll open for us. So um, you don't have audio, um, but this is some of our team members. And what you're seeing is the 3D camera. Um, and what we've been doing is, this is actually our Christmas party, so this is some of our team members, and we're playing Bean Boodle, Boozled, anybody ever play that? Okay, so Bean Boozled, it's, you order them from Jelly Belly, and it's basically Russian roulette with jelly beans. So one of them is vomit, and the other one is like lemon lime. And they both look the same, and you pick one, you spin, and it, you gotta pick a color, and you eat it. But here's the biggest difference. Yeah, Sydney, Sydney was the best. Um, so this is some of our team member, but here's the biggest difference. And um, uh, Kara actually shared it the other day. Uh, we are taking some of these 3D videos and we're actually bringing them into like Storyline and then we're making them interactive where you can actually click on people and see the interactive content that way. That is what I consider to be like a virtual environment. Like if you were using the Samsung phone and you put it on one of those headsets, you're basically looking at a split screen video, okay? The, and we're calling it virtual reality, okay? But really, it's immersive video, in my opinion. It's not virtual reality, okay? Um, it's still kind of the same thing. It's still video-based, though. It's still, like, literally, this is just video-based. So I can't go, like, if I'm in one of those 3D video experiences, I can't walk over here and see like this 3D spatial spot. That's why I called the other one 3D spatial because no matter where I move, I'm in still 3D experience. In the video VR, I'm in a fixed location and I see that environment, okay? So they're split, they're not the same in my opinion. So when we talk about it, we're talking about 3D video for virtual reality or we're talking about 3D spatial. And the 3D spatial means no matter where I am in that space, I'm still in a 3D environment and it looks different, okay? For me in that video, I have to click on something and we'd have to record it over here and have that spatial experience. Oh, thank you. And then we have augmented reality. This has become very popular and it's gonna be even more popular in our industry. I don't know if you guys know this, but this is extremely popular right now with like uh, museums and with magazines. As you guys know, print is dying. Rapidly, so print's trying to figure out like what can they do to keep us engaged in print? So one of the cool things that they've been doing is augmented reality with your phone as a phone app on top of you Interacting with the magazine or the book and what this does is it allows you to still be Engaged in it by interacting with it and learning from it But at the same time having this immersive experience by seeing it 
Yeah, you know what this, in my opinion, this is a, this is a great example of how we could resurrect kids in, into books. And what do I mean by that? When they have a tablet, do you think they want to pick the book up? No, they don't. But if we can ingrain them together, then all of a sudden you're now taking what they're used to and bringing it into something you're used to. Does this make sense? So augmented reality is becoming um, extremely popular. And this one's on a mobile phone. And that's where I see the least entry to bar or barrier to entry and what we see now. Obviously, we know Pokemon Go is taken off, things like that. But I also think as we go, you're going to see more and more magazines like this. Don't worry, Playboy will not do this. Hugh Hefner died. For all of you people that were wondering, sorry, gentlemen. Not going to happen, OK? Hey, yes. Um, another one I think we're going to see more often of, and this I, I would say we're probably about five years out, but has anybody seen um, the actual uh, Mario, the HoloLenses? Anybody ever heard of a Microsoft HoloLens? A Microsoft HoloLens, for all of you who don't know, is right there. It's an actual pair of glasses, and it's not like the Google glasses, but what ends up happening is it's an overlay of 3D modeling and interaction on top of your real life. I personally think, and this is what this guy's doing, is actually playing Mario Brothers on the side of the street in those glasses. I've actually got to try this myself, and it's, it's awesome. It's a lot of fun. I personally think this is what we're going to see. I think we're going to see, in the future, our phones on our wrists and us wearing headsets, and not Google headsets, like these HoloLens headsets, where data and information is overlaid as we need it. And so for all of you, this is real. He's actually playing that, but he's on the side of the road. So this is a pure form of what augmented reality really is, is giving you an overlay and allowing you to be able to do that in a fun and engaging way. Now the downfall is, is the Microsoft HoloLens is like 1500 bucks a piece right now. So as technology, again, we got a two year cycle. So if it's 1500 bucks, two years will be seven. Four years, it'll be 350. You get it? So six years from now, we'll all have them. So what's next for you guys that actually want to get into this stuff? Here's what I want you to make sure that you take home from this. Um, the first thing is be creative. Start with your knowledge checks. If you want to mess around with these, pick up and start learning the software and see how you can make just one small knowledge check for them to try. Okay? And the reason why is it doesn't actually have to build into your storyline course. You could just import it in to your LMS as a knowledge check in between a lesson or something of that nature. Be a gamer. One of the things I always say is test out new games that you're not interested in. I do not like Candy Crush, but I play it because I try to figure out why people want to play it. <laughs> right? Like, why do they want to do this? Oh, I get it. That's fun. That's cute. I like that. OK. I get it. Doesn't mean I like the game. So next time your kids are playing Call of Duty, Assassin's Creed, or anything like that, sit down and ask them, what did they learn? What are you learning, and why are you trying to overcome that challenge? So you can understand their motivational factor. That actually might help you as you go through your life with that individual. Because now you'll see what he or she's motivational factors actually are, and you can use those to your advantage. Parents. <laughs> sleuth. Be sleuthing. Interview the audience to find out what their motivations are. I just talked about it. Without understanding what gets somebody to tick, you can't necessarily get them motivated. There are motivational factors for each one of us. Some of it's money, some of it's fame, some of it's status. It depends on who you are and what you're interested in. Be comfortable. If you are not comfortable with building in a gaming engine or you're like, oh my gosh, that seems very overwhelming, it doesn't mean you can't make a mini game in, in Captivate, Storyline, Raptivity, iSpring, or Lectora. You can do those. It's about the creativity and not necessarily just about the, the, the technology. We all know that, right? We all have that friend that has an iPhone 2 and you're like, I don't even, you're an idiot. I don't even know how you even have an iPhone, right? Like a good example, Matt Pierce taught me today about the grid system on the camera. I felt like a dumbass, so thank you, Matt. It's true. Be patient. Here's what I can tell you. It takes one and a half times longer to build a game than it does a presentation style e-learning module. And it takes one and a half times longer. But the thing is, here's what I can tell you, and I forgot to put this on it. Dang it, I was going to do this. There, it's statistically shown, and this was by ATD back in 2015. They did a study. 
out of 11 slides, no, one out of every 11 slide is not um, remembered at all. So what that means is at the 11th slide of every presentation, no one will remember that slide. No one. So you know what I say? Put the interactive knowledge check at slide 11. That'll change real fast. Right? So that means every time you do a slide deck and you have 22 slides, two slides, they will not remember at all whatsoever. Be rewarding. One of the things I could tell you is make sure you reward them for participating. You know, one of the biggest things that I found that works great for rewards is just a, hey, thanks for playing that. Hey, great job in doing that. Believe it or not, people like recognition. This is the cheapest and most effective way to engage and get people to do things you want them to do. And this one is some of the most important. Be justified. Do a survey in the learning experience so you can get feedback because you're going to have your boss go, why did we spend all this time making a game? If you can provide that information back to say, look, these people like this and retain this way more than they ever did anything else we did, and not just say it, but actually have your proof of it, then all of a sudden you will change your culture instantaneously. Because as soon as they see results, they will let you run for this. Be collaborative. One of the things I love about this conference is we're all collaborating. Everybody's very open. Everybody likes to talk about the struggles and the things that we're doing and the tech that we're using and how we're we using it effectively. Be collaborative. If you're building a game, yell at somebody like me and say, hey, what would you do in this? How would you do this? I'm more than willing to say, try this, don't do that, because I would rather see you make it a success for your organization than to what I've seen in the past. They build something, they throw it up there, they do it, and then some executive says, yeah, we don't think that worked very well, or that, that really wasn't of interest to ours. Let's just go back to what we were doing before this. So make sure that you be collaborative to make sure that you can get it applied correctly and that you're taking the right steps to ensure that you're going to have a success. Be humble. You are not the target audience. I hate Candy Crush. If my employees love Candy Crush, guess what type of game I should be buy or building? Candy Crush. For all of you, we could have said Bejeweled because Candy Crush is just a ripoff of Bejeweled. For all of you that didn't know that. So understand, you should not dictate the type of game that you build, the interest of the people that you're working with do. And then be about the business. One of the things I can tell you is you have to have the results at the end. I'm a business owner. We just did a two hour presentation on Friday of every analytical thing that is happening with inside of our organization. Every single number and every division of our organization. If you can show me that this is going to increase something by X amount of percent, I'll let you do it all day long. But if I don't see that, if I don't see how this game is going to impact the business, then you're not going to get to do it. So you should come in not saying, I want to build a game. You should come in saying, I'm going to change the issue with cross-selling by building a game that has them practice cross-selling so that we can increase the cross-selling capabilities of our sales staff by X percent. Because you want to know something? The executives care about numbers, period. I'm an executive. All I care about is numbers. Kara knows this, give me the numbers, give me the stats, so I can analyze them and make sure that we're doing what we should be doing, period. You give them that and you're on your way. And then be the game changer. We love to be complacent, especially in the training realm, right? Do as we know, build our presentation style e-learning. Be that person that does something a little bit on the side, that maybe the boss, and I'm saying this, I love, I love this, do it and ask forgiveness later, okay? So what does that mean? Spend 15 minutes on your mini game that you want to do and then go back to your traditional e-learning module. Spend 15 more minutes, come back to your e traditional e-learning modules so that then you can turn to your boss and say, I built this on the side. What do you think? Could we roll this out and see what happens? Be that game changer, okay? But don't, don't just dive right into it because you'll get shot down. Why? Because your boss has initiatives that they have to meet. But if you do just a little bit at a time, you'll find that you actually have the ability to build up what you want. Thank you, guys. Thank you very much.
If you do want to nerd it up, you can shoot me an email. Um, I'm on Twitter um, if you want to harass me there. And um, I do want to say thank you guys very much for coming. I hope that you at least gained some uh, information. Again, Construct 2, Unity 3D, Unreal, Game Maker, those are some of the best ones to start out, especially if you're familiar with the e-learning production side. And um, until then, stay creative. Thank you guys.